Right. But let me ask you, uh, Edwin, you know, coming from the business perspective and uh, being in that part of the world, which is really opaque, you know, you know, we, we, when you open up Wall Street Journal you, or, or Financial Times, you read about Europe, you read about Asia, you read about, you know, many parts of the world. Africa is still not making the headlines. How does that feel? And, 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 and as a businessman, as building a business there, what challenges it brings and, and, and how do you, well, how do you want to educate this crowd here about the risks that they should think about when they think about Africa? Thank you very much. Um, I come from um, Zimbabwe. Most of you know where Zimbabwe is, the problems that we've had in that country regarding the land reform program. I happen to be in Africa and I started in 1996 when uh, I will start supplying fresh vegetables into the supermarket chains. I was dealing with Tesco. As you all know, Tesco is not an easy company to deal with. You are as good as you are today. There are no contracts. So whatever you produce, you've got to meet the, your quota. Um, we started off uh, the business uh, growing on four farms in Zimbabwe. And at the time, our tenor was 300,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, in 1998, they hit the 50 million US dollars mark. We were employing 15,000 people. We had a farm which was uh, in uh, Manikane, it was called Kondosi, and during the um, um, land reform, <coughs> we lost that farm. So it meant that out of uh, whatever we were supplying, our program was cut by 40%. So I had to rush into Tesco, and Tesco was going to cancel the contract. I assured them that I was going to be able to do it. And the question was, how are you going to do it when land is being disputed? So I decided to decide a way forward. I approached uh, 5,000 farmers, small scale farmers, each with half a hectare. I grouped them and then um, started teaching them how to grow the vegetables. The model actually worked very well, better than the previous model. And we started reviving project and uh, uh, in 2006 I had about 5,000 farmers who were all growing fresh vegetables for export in store market chains. Now these are people who used to live below the poverty debt in life. The guys were earning more, I think uh, less than a dollar a day. But what happened in the program that I gave them, each one of them was actually earning between $250 to $500 a month. And what that did is it created empowerment in them. They suddenly decided they were going to be able to uh, do other things. Now, <clears throat> the biggest risks that you face in Africa at the moment are one, political. The politicians, um, most of them want to stay in power forever. But as you can see, as time is going on now, the old generation is moving on. A new generation is coming in. We have a big problem um, that uh, we face in the sense that a lot of the business people have now become associated with these politicians. And so it's very difficult to move. You have to be in a position when you go into that country where you can influence decisions. The only way you can influence decisions is when you target the growing numbers of people. Because uh, it is strategic for politicians. Uh, especially African politicians to make people poor. Because if they are poor, then they can go and every time, every time they want to be voted in, in, in power, they go to them and talk to them about uh, food, they talk to them about delivering this, they make false promises, and then they are voted back into power. So there is really a big uh, problem at the moment in terms of uh, how one positions himself in the light, in light of the things that are taking place in, uh, in Africa, particularly in Zimbabwe. You have empowerment programs. Uh, where now the majority of the people are being asked to own the, uh, take ownership of the assets uh, in the country, yet there is no funding. And what happens is that you have a foreign investor coming into the country, you have a project that you want to put in place, you are told you can only take 49%, 51% uh, just to go to the locals. And the question is, how is it going to be funded? So there are gaps there. So there is an opportunity now for foreign investors to come. There is an opportunity for foreign capital to come in and actually advance and meet that gap. 
Yeah, in fact, on that point, right, I mean, a lot of uh, Chinese companies, companies from Asia, from different parts of Asia, are entering into Africa. I mean, are you aware of certain success stories of, you know, with people who have actually made material uh, uh, return on investments and, and actually really dealt with risk properly? I mean, is this something, you, are you seeing the resurgence of those kinds of success stories now? What I'm seeing at the moment are not successes. What I'm seeing is, is patronage. Someone comes in, is in good, uh, um, um, rapport with uh, the government of the day, uh, he's given a contract and he's given business people that he can make. But the actual um, proper business is being done outside the politics. And I must also mention that, you know, what is happening at the moment, we are looking at a situation where business is now in control. And as we go forward, I think that a lot of business people will be able to determine the future rather than the politicians themselves. You know? So what we have decided to do is we look at all these risks and we have seen the best ways to manage them. And what we do is we try and bring in, a, we include everybody in our programs. One of the things that we're doing because of lack of funding, because obviously uh, international capital markets are shy on Africa, we have to set the examples ourselves and show them that it's not as risky as they think. One of the things that we have decided to do at the moment is we are attracting capital from uh, foreign investors, and we ask them to put the money in a fund. We guarantee their capital uh, sum, but offer them a return to the guarantee. What we do is they invest money in a pool of funds that is managed, say, by an entity such as JP Morgan, in um, an area of their choice. So they put in their money there. We then use that money, not as cash, but to build a balance sheet in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. <coughs> build a balance sheet in Zimbabwe. We then launch what we, uh, raise what we call uh, angel bonds. The angel bonds are meant for uh, local investors. These are foreign companies who do not want to pay tax. So they will invest in the bond. What then happens is that the capital sum that he puts in the bond is tax deductible. So he will invest in the bond and will use that money now to fund expand our operations uh, to fund the small-scale farmers who are in dire need of uh, funding. But what we, we also do is we manage the risk. How do we manage the risk? Because there's the risk, the risk of uh, lack of production, lack of knowledge. We've got a great number of extension service staff who teach these people the best ways to grow the uh, products. Everything is managed and uh, taken to the markets so that at least there's no uh, point of failure. So we manage all those risks and risks. So what happens if you put in your money, if you buy the angel bonds, you get the, the return that you get on the angel bonds, on the, on the angel bonds is tax, taxable. But the capital sum that you put in is tax deductible. Yeah. We are finding that uh, it is uh, um, an area where you have to apply a lot of innovation to survive. Now this is and the, yet the, the high returns to be made. And this is a great example, right? I mean, you, so, so there is an in-country risk.